Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the gathering place right here in beautiful Simi Valley, California. Last night, it was the hub of America in that they had the uh, Republican national debate right at Ronald Reagan Library. There is a spirit that is deposited here because of that presidency and what it meant and the freedom. Um, it was really one of the first modern presidents who really tracked after freedom. That's why they tried to kill him. But God spared him, and he did a lot to affect America in a lot of ways, and I believe that God has a future for America. Some people may not see it, but it's coming. All right. Anyways, let's, um, let's get into it. The title, if you need to change the title up there, is really, Jesus Could Do What Moses Couldn't Do. That's the title. Jesus could do what Moses couldn't do. But I want to give you a couple of scriptures concerning kingdom finances first before we take the offering tonight. And this one here, I remember um, memorizing this when I was in uh, you know, the Nazarene church as a kid. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And this first part, this first part of the verse, if somebody had got up there and said, hey, this means that you won't have any want, I think they would have probably had heart attacks. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When you allow the Lord to be the one that guides you, you will not have want. What is everybody in this world afraid of? They're afraid of lack because that's Satan's foundation. If the Bible says the love of money or the lust of a thing is the root of all evil, but no matter how much you have, it's never enough. Any of those billionaires, you look at them, they can never have enough. You can never have enough to give you peace. But when the Lord is your shepherd, you won't have want. That's a promise. In Psalm 34, 7 through 10, it says, The angel of the Lord encamps round about them that fear him. He doesn't mean afraid like God's going to throw rocks at you. He means like that reverent respect of God. <clears throat> and it says he delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Bless is the man that trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want... To them that fear him. Notice he didn't say there's no lack. There's no want. What do you want? So think about this for just a moment. Now under David's rulership, Israel was a very wealthy kingdom. Make no mistake. But when Solomon began to rule and the spirit of wisdom was upon him, Israel became the richest nation the world had ever known. Even in the Bible it says silver was as stones. But tradition says there were piles of silver outside the city. That's how great the wealth was. Was Solomon just you know, that much better at creating? No. He had the spirit of wisdom. Is God broke? No. You know, like, <clears throat> like if somebody was doing your driveway and they go, we're going to put this special driveway in there. And they go, oh, I don't, I don't need that. I just, <clears throat> you know, just give me this one. But God says, no, my streets are gold. It's not that he's trying to tell us anything. It's a revelation of who he is. Everything is extravagant with him. Because the spirit of lack on this world, the spirit of the age on this world tells everybody we should have nothing. When you go to countries like Haiti and other countries where they worship 350,000 different gods... There's incredible poverty. And it doesn't matter. You could put, you could give them $10 billion, <clears throat> they'll have poverty in a moment. There was this group of people, they were, um, they were close on the verge of homeless, but they just didn't have any wisdom finance wise. And I remember we helped them out and we gave them a lot of money. We, you know, our church, and we brought them groceries. And, and this one guy sold a car and he had spent the money like within a day and a half. I just didn't have wisdom to understand the kingdom finances. But Solomon did, and his finances continued to grow. And so Solomon, he's just a re Solomon was a revelation of God. Abraham, the father of faith, said he was what? Very rich. Not kind of rich. 
very rich in cattle, which is his business, silver and gold. We know he had a company of 5,000. He was a man of faith. If he was a father of faith, then he shouldn't have had anything, right? We're supposed to be broke? No. God blessed him. Listen, he left his father's house. He left his land and began to accumulate. Why? Because the Lord blessed him. Jacob went over the hill with nothing, came back with everything. God is a God of blessing. Blessed is the man that trusts in him, verse 8. There is no want to them that fear him, verse 9. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not, say it, didn't say need, shall not want. There's things you need. You know, you need a bed to sleep in, you need a pillow. But what do you want? I want the my pillow, you know, whatever, you know, you want the, you want the one that works better for you. So it's not just what you need. God promises what you want. He will lead you into it. It's not just going to fall on you, but he will lead you into it. Are you with me? Yes. Last one. The blessing of the Lord, it makes rich. What, is the blessing of, what does the blessing of Satan do? It impoverishes you. But the blessing of the Lord makes rich. He has no sorrow with it. There's no sorrow with riches that come from God. Now, if you're rich outside of God, you might have a lot of sorrow. Don't get me wrong. Satan does make deals with people. And there are people that are rich that are not godly, but they have sorrow. They do, not, they do not have blessing. All right. So we're going we're gonna to receive the offering, and then we're going to do a little declaration. I know it says decoration, but that's because my thing typed it in for me. You know how you put one thing in, all of a sudden you get a hold. There we go. That's better. So at this time, we're going to receive the offering, and if you're make it out checks, make them out to the gathering place or those that give to Soaring Ministries. Same thing. If you're texting, it's right up there on the screen. And there's envelopes for anybody here that gives cash. If you have a flying car that's certified, just make that out to Bob Cathers. <laughs> I'm taking it home with me. All right. Pray this prayer with me. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for being my high priest. As my high priest, I'm asking you to bring my tithes and offerings. Present them unto our Father as an offering in righteousness, as a sweet savor. Father, you said to prove you in this way. So I'm proving you by my giving. And I thank you for the opening of the windows of heaven to pour out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive. But we receive it tonight. And I thank you for rebuking the devourer for our sakes. And Father, we command in alignment with your spirit gas prices in California. I command you to come down. Come down. Now you watch, you're going to start coming down. All right, ushers, go ahead and receive the offering. While they're doing that, this is a little declaration. It has a couple scriptures that are put together, but do it with me. I do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you know what I need before I ask you. I remember always that you are the one who gives me power to get wealth, thus establishing your covenant as I seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. All good things are added unto me. Lord, because you are my shepherd, I have no want. I am blessed 
Because I trust in you. And I seek you, Lord. I do not want or lack any good thing. I magnify you, Lord. And I thank you that you have pleasure in my prosperity. I trust in the Lord. I do good. So I dwell in the land with great abundance. I delight myself also in the Lord. And He gives me the desires of my heart. Father, I come to you by faith. And you reward me because I diligently seek you. You are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. I declare the blessing of the Lord makes me rich and adds no sorrow with it. Amen. God is good. Amen. All right. Now listen, when God starts blessing you, it may not hit you all at once. But he will bless you and he will give you confirmations of things that he's doing. Like I could have confirmed some things to you tonight because I could see, this, I could see the spirit of the Lord upon you. And I could see the blessing of the Lord, but it's not just in your finances, in your fi- family and in your finances. And then how many times have I prophesied to you, Michael? But you, you had like, like nothing when you started, but the Holy Spirit has been promoting you. He's, not, he's beyond just a, a manager now. He's a regional and that's the goodness of God. Yes. Yes. What are you saying, Bob? Be faithful to God. Pray. Keep seeking Him. Don't get discouraged. Don't let discouragement come in there. Speak His Word. Pray in the Holy Spirit. And it may not happen overnight, but God will bless your life. He will bless your life, and then you can become a, that blessing to others. And that's what we want. We want God to bless us, but we want to bless others. Amen. All right. So here we go in Hebrews 2, and we kind, of finished over, we kind of finished with this the other day, but I love this scripture so much, I just like to read it. It says, for truly, the word verily is truly, he took not on him the nature of angels, speaking about Jesus, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. I know we've gone over this a couple times, but it's, it's, it's a powerful thing to know because Hollywood gives a secular version of angels and demons and what they do. They show you demons as being powerful, as powerful as angels. And um, they show you as angels, oh, I can't break that rule. I can't break that rule. And, um, or sometimes even a little weaselly. But demons are afraid of angels. They'll get their clocks clean. Now, there was a branch of angels that sinned. And they lost their standing with God. So that's why it says he took not on him the nature of angels. Now there are some religions, like say Jehovah Witness, they believe that Jesus was Michael, the archangel. But if he was an angel, why would it say he took not on the nature of angels? And then in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, they had bad translators that translated a God. But any good translator said, no, God. But this one here, to me, is even more clear. That he took not on the nature of angels because that means he could have redeemed angels. Now, if he was an angel, he wouldn't have had to take on anything. He could have just went in there and redeemed them. But he was the word of God. He was God. He took on our nature, who we are. He became a man. And remember, there's man, male, and female. There's man and there's wombed man. So he took on that nature so that he could redeem us. To make us what? Exactly like him. Exactly like him. Not kind of, not close. Exactly like him. All right. I know we've already gone into that a few times, so let's move on. So verse 17, it says this. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Made like unto us that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. So in other words, he understands the things you're going through. 
to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure or strengthen those that are tempted. Passion translation is a little more clear. This is why he had to become a man and take hold of our humanity in every way. He made us his brothers and sisters and became our merciful and faithful king of priests before God. So he stands before God as king, king of kings, but he also stands before God as a priest. And that's something as we go through Hebrews, we're going to see more and more. A lot of people don't realize the legal parameters that Jesus set, that the legal authority that he gave us. We don't know the legal authority that he gave us. We don't know our rights. It's like if, you, if you're American and you grew up and you didn't know the Constitution. Or you didn't know you had any other rights. You didn't know any of the amendments. Freedom of speech. People could tell you anything. You just believe it. Well, we have things that belong to us, but if you don't know it, that's like he said in Romans, it's like you're a child because you don't know your rights. So he took hold of our humanity, made us brothers and sisters, and we beca- he became our most full and faithful king priest before God as one who removed our sins to make us one with him. Now, the title was, Jesus could do what Moses couldn't do. Well, what couldn't Moses do? He couldn't die for your sins. Why? Because Moses had sin. Jesus, Jesus was born of a virgin. Listen, this is the Old Testament prophesies and promises that someone would be born of a virgin. Sorry, Tom. He promises someone would be born of a virgin. But that's not possible but it is. Why? Why did someone have to be born of a virgin? Because no matter who was born, they came from the lineage and the seed of Adam. And since they came from the seed of Adam, it didn't matter if it was Moses or Daniel or Elijah. Didn't matter who it was. Didn't matter if it was Abraham, father of faith. Didn't matter if it was David. They all had a nature of sin. And even the greatest. Abraham failed. How? How? He had Ishmael. He was supposed to have a son through Sarah. But Sarah badgered him, so he had a son through her maid. Messed up. Of course, he was a a good liar. I mean, he wasn't like a, it wasn't a wicked liar. He didn't like walk around lying all the time. But, you know, when a king came out to greet him, he's like, your wife's a hot tamale. I'd like to marry her. It's my sister, or you're not your wife, your sister. He goes, it's my sister. Go ahead, take her. It's not just that he lied and said it was his sister. Then he tried to cover up his lie. He said, well, she's my half-sister. But he said, oh, yeah, go ahead, take her. And God had to come to the king at night. And that happened two different times. So he's pretty imperfect. Moses, pretty imperfect. Murders an Egyptian. And if he was, you know, feeling really righteous and everything, he would have stayed. But he'd, he ran for his life, so he was afraid. Moses struck the rock twice, disobeyed God, pretty imperfect. Elijah whined about there was nobody in Israel. God said, I still have 7,000. David, man after God's heart, commits adultery. Then out of the adultery, because of a pregnancy... Ends up murdering the husband of the woman he committed adultery with? These are, these are all really good guys. I mean, Daniel's, Daniel's kind of like the most, most upright. Like he didn't do any, any of this stuff. But he was a eunuch, so there really wasn't much he could do. <laughs> there were no heirs for him. So what did God do? God said, God sent himself because he's a three-part being. That's beyond our our comprehension in some ways. But even you, you're a three-part being. You're a spirit, a soul, and a body. If your spirit was to leave your body, you could look down upon your body. And you know what? Maybe you would say, body, I love you. We need to tell our bodies we love it. Speak life to our bodies, not curse them. 
And so God sent himself and said he became a son. And it says in Hebrews 1, 3, that he was the mirror likeness of the image of God. He looked exactly like God. Why? Because he was meant to be a revelation to us of how much God loved us. The leper, when he came to Jesus, he said, I know you can heal me, but I don't know you will heal me. Now, we, we could look at that and laugh and go, well, of course, Jesus, you know, he's full of compassion. But he didn't know that. He felt unworthy. He didn't feel that he was worthy to receive that healing. Jesus said he was moved with compassion, stretched forth his hands, said, I will. When Jesus forgave the sins of the man that was... I, I, can you imagine how angry somebody would be? They've been bad fast their whole life, and they, they, they feel like maybe God did it. And then he comes, you know, his friends drop him down through the roof, and there's all the scribes and the Pharisees, and they had all kinds of ailments. It said the power of the Lord was present to heal them, but none of them were healed. They had all kinds of ailments, but they were so judgmental. But he drops this man down, and Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven. I'm saying that right now. If you don't get anything else tonight, your sins, are, your sins have been forgiven. That's what Moses couldn't do. Moses could cover the sins with a high priest once a year, but he couldn't forgive them. That's why they said, who can forgive sins but only God? They'd, see, they'd even say Moses could forgive sins because they knew he couldn't. Only God. But Jesus is God, so they were right. He forgave the sins. A king priest before God. So as the priests in the book of Levi and Leviticus went before God and they presented offerings and they covered the sins of the people for a year, Jesus, as a priest, went before God with his blood. And we'll see that more as we go further into Hebrews. And he used his blood to wipe out our sins, to abolish them. Not only that, it says he, he even cleansed the commandments contained in ordinances. In other words, the very ordinances that said sin, he wiped them out. Not just the sin, but he wiped out the ordinances that said what sin was. That's how much he's released you. But then every day we're begging God, oh Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I spit on Fred yesterday. <laughs> well, yeah, you should be sorry you spit on Fred. But anyways, a lot of times we're sorry for things we don't need to be sorry about. Faith is not, listen, faith is not believing in, you know, what God might do to me bad. Faith is believing in the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God. It said he suffered and endured every test and temptation so that he can help us every time we pass through the ordeals of life. I don't know, I think that's pretty good. Now, I'm just going to kind of go through 1 John here, just because this, I, I love this passage. But there's a couple things in here, especially verse 5, that I just want you to get. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. So how much does God love you? He calls you sons. You may not think you are, you may not feel like it, but you are. You're, you're the height of his creation. He loves you. He adores you. Think, think of a mother with a newborn baby. She's looking at him and think, and there's nothing she loves more in the world at that moment than that baby. Now, you think about a thousand times more, that's God with you. That's how God feels about you. No, I, 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 I'm not very good, Bob. Doesn't matter. Jesus didn't come because you were very good. He came because he was very good. Christianity is not about how good you are. It's about how good he is. He said, therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Not going to be, we are now. It doesn't appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. So everybody has to, we have to have hope, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So we all need hope. He's saying, hope in the fact that God has purified you. 
Have hope in, in how pure he has made you. You're pure. He made you that way. You didn't make yourself that way, but he made you that way. If we took a poll in the room and said, okay, let's see you the best person here, the person who walks most upright, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who walks the most uprightly. It's, it matters how uprightly he is. That's the difference in Christianity. It's the uprightness of Christ. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. Can a Christian sin? Only one way you can sin. You have to put yourself back under the law of Moses. If you put yourself under the law of Moses, then you can sin because you're breaking the law. If you put yourself under the law, you can break the law. Now you have sinned. But if there's no law, and it says we're no longer under the law, if there's no law, then you can't sin. Verse 5, here it is. You know that he was manifested to take away our sins. What did Jesus come to do? He came to take away our sins and take away the consciousness of our sins. Can you imagine one of your children coming up to you, a child, five or six, come up to you and said, I, I am so sorry. I, I, I didn't put both my shoes on. I know you wanted me to put them on, and I didn't put them on. I'm just so sorry. I'm such an evil child. You, know, you wouldn't think they're an evil child, and you wouldn't say, what an evil child. I'm sorry they were... No. You say, hey, it's okay. You'll get it right next time. You, you, when your child does something wrong, you don't stop loving them. You love them exactly the same. They may need, be to, they need to be corrected, but you love them exactly the same. You know, if my child is, is going to run into the street, if one of my grandkids, <laughs> you know, Kristen's kids are a little bit younger. Um, there's a pretty busy street. Thankfully, there's, you know, the gate and a wall there. But if they run anywhere out there, because sometimes they want to follow me out, it's like, hey, hold my hand. Like, I'm really firm about that. Hold my hand. It's not because I'm mad at them, because, they you know, they're wanting to dart and do this and that. It's like, hold my hand, because I know these cars are coming by. And these cars, if they, if they dart out, they're not even going to see them, and it'd be all over. It's like, no, you're going to hold my hand. Why? Why? Why are you so firm, Bob? Because I love them. And I know I'm going to protect them. So I'm firm because I love them, not because I'm angry with them. I, I love them just as much as when they run and I hug them. But I'm, it's the same love that wants to hug them wants to protect them. That's how God is. That's why he tells us to do or not to do things. Not to hurt us. Not because he's angry. Not because he's an anthill going, oh, look, I'm just stepping on the anthill. No. He was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Well, that's the key right there, isn't it? In him is no sin. Because there's no sin in him, and he's in you, there's no sin in you. But what if I do something wrong? What, what, what if you, you're going to do something? <laughs> you're going to do something wrong all the time. It doesn't mean you have to sin every day, but I'm just saying, you're going to do things wrong. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to do dumb things. You're going to do things you're sorry for. In him is no sin. It's not about you. It's about him. It's about how much he loves you. That's not easy to comprehend. It's very, as a matter of fact, it's very difficult. In the Old Testament, it was love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the New Testament is in 1 John 4.10, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In the Old Testament, there was no salvation. But in the New Testament, there is perfect salvation. And the salvation is not, it's not a thing you do. It's someone you know. Well, Bob, I married, a, I married a computer, and it talks to me. And what does it talk? Well, I ask it a question, and it answers me. It's not a soul. It's not a person. not there. It doesn't love you. But I love it. No, it doesn't love you. You might love what it can do, but it doesn't love you. Religion is loving a computer. Jesus is being in love with somebody who loves you more than you love them. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. In other words, his righteousness is on the inside of you, and it manifests through you. 
He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So who sins? Those who aren't born again. A person who's not born again is a sinner. A person who's born again is not a sinner. You know, like Billy Graham would say, I'm an old sinner saved by grace. No, I was a sinner, but when I was saved by grace, I'm no longer a sinner. And then verse 9 just solidifies that. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin. Because he's born of God. That's what the priesthood does. It means that I cannot sin. But I can sin. I know. But you can't sin. But I can sin. I know. But you can't sin. And I know you know this, but there may be somebody who doesn't know this. Look, we've already got the diagram here. So God... Come on, work. There we go. So you have God. He breathed into man the breath of life. He actually breathes it into the body, which is the spirit. And then man becomes a living soul. Spirit, soul, and body. The body is laying there on the ground, made from the dirt. God breathes life into it. Now, when Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time to his mother's womb and be born? He goes, no, no, no. He goes, you misunderstand. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So when you're born again, your body is not born again. One day your body will be renewed, but it won't be, it won't be born again. You won't have to be born and raised up from a child all over again. Your body will be regenerated. But your spirit was born again. That's why Peter said, as newborn babes desire the sincere miracle of the word that you may grow. Grow into what? Christ. Can you imagine having the confidence of Christ? He's a pretty confident guy, right? He thought he was right about everything. <laughs> well, he was right about everything. But he's pretty confident. He knew what he was talking about. He was a fully grown son of God. And that's what we're, that's what we're moving toward. That's why we pray in the Spirit. You pray in an unknown tongue to build your spirit, man. It doesn't build your soul. It doesn't necessarily build your body, but it builds your spirit so your spirit grows. That's where your born-again nature is. So you see the seed that's right there. That seed is in your spirit. And that seed is Christ. So the seed of Christ is in you, and the seed of Christ is... Cannot, it cannot sin. Can't. Can't do it. It's not possible. Therefore, the seed of Christ in you cannot sin. Therefore, you cannot sin. So God can look at you as if you are without sin. No, Bob, but I sin. I know. But God can look at you as if you are without sin. And you can look at him as if you are without sin. That means you can come into his presence. There's nothing that can stop you from coming before him. When you pray in the spirit, what's happening is the spirit is starting to override your soul. That thinks all kinds of crazy stuff. It's overriding your soul so that your soul begins to understand the access that it has to God and who you really are. One day we will all know who we really are. Right now, we know about this much of who we are. If you knew this much, you'd be doing the things that Jesus did. Jesus said, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He didn't do anything because he was the Son of God on earth, or he'd done a bunch. Of, he'd have been doing it from the time he was three years old. He didn't do anything until he was 30 until the Holy Spirit came on him. He did everything he did according to the promises of God and because he was a man on the earth with authority as a man. So you have authority and dominion on the earth as a man. But I'm a woman, same thing. Same dominion, same authority. So you have authority on the earth because of that. You just don't know it. Jesus could speak to a tree and it could grow. 
or it could die. So can you? No, I don't know. Listen, in our last house, we had these two trees every year. The leaves come up, same time, came up together. On this one year, one of the trees, the leaves just stopped, stopped coming. One month, two months, three months. Looks like the tree was dead. Corner said, well, probably going to have to take it out. I'm getting ready to take it out. And then I just thought, I'm going to speak to this tree. According to Mark 11, 20, 23. See, Jesus could speak to a tree. I can speak to a tree. We're both a couple of tree huggers. So I, said, I spoke to the tree. Within a week of speaking to the tree, the leaves started growing. On that tree, fully sprouted, full leaves again. Well, maybe it just was late, three months. Never had done it the whole time we were there. Simeon Cayua, I've told you his story before. He was the father of the born again movement in Uganda. Jesus appeared to him and spoke to him. And he, he, said, um, he said, read Isaiah 61. He said, you're going to be that for my people. And so, under the regime of Idi Amin, in the 70s, they were killing everybody, especially men. Men were hiding in trees anywhere they could hide. Oh, they were just murdering everywhere. It was, it was the worst, one of the worst dictators ever to walk the earth. And, um, but he was afraid of the prayers of Simeon Kaiua. He had a church that seated about 400, and there were people living there because Idi Amin's men wouldn't come there. And then he, he saw this woman one day trying to feed her baby, and she had no food. And so he went to the Catholic church, and they gave him some rotten fish. And I'm not picking on the Catholic church, just that's what happened to him. And so he said, God, what am I going to do? And God spoke to him and said, speak to the mango tree. Well, there had been a mango tree there forever, but it had never produced a single mango. Now he said, speak to the mango tree, according to Mark 11, 23. So he spoke to the mango tree. Within one week, it was full of mangoes, fully grown mangoes. And the mango trees kept producing mangoes. Until the day that Idi Amin's regime fell, which, by the way, he went to a place where there was this rock, and all these villagers came out because God had all given them visions of this guy coming and doing this. And while he was on this rock, he proclaimed the day that Idi Amin's regime would fall. Now, again, I, listen, I've been to his church, and I interviewed him for a couple of hours, and he preached at our church, came out here. I talked to his people. There were, there were 12 people raised from the dead in his church, but not only that. And I talked to some of the people that were there during a the time. They, they were coming off a fast, and they had made 400 sandwiches. But 800 people showed up. And they said, Simeon, we only have 400 sandwiches. You know, some of you said, well, cut them in half. <laughs> but there's 800 people. And he said, don't worry, it's going to be just fine. Everybody had a sandwich. The young guys, you know, they had four, five, six. I know I talked to some of them. Everybody had multiple sandwiches, and, and that was 800 people eating 400 sandwiches, and at the end, there were still sandwiches left over. Now listen, I don't want to have to go and look to a mango tree to get food every day, and you don't have to, thank God, but it's possible. That's something that the sons of God have authority to do. We have that authority on the earth. All right. Still with me? Yeah. It feels like I went a long time, but it's only half an hour. I must be boring myself tonight. All right. In Hebrews 3, because we're moving to the next chapter, it says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heaven, heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Look at that from the Passion Translation. And so, dear brothers and sisters, you are now made holy. Everybody say, I am holy. I am holy. But I don't feel holy. But you are. It doesn't matter what you feel. Your feelings are lying to you. You are holy. And each one of you is invited to the feast of your heavenly calling. So fasten your thoughts fully onto Jesus, whom we embrace as our apostle and king priest. So there were no apostles until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we have apostles. 
culture changers. That's really what apostle is, a culture changer. It was a term of the day, military. There would be military leaders where apostles, they would come into a place and they would change the culture of that place to bring it into what it was. But in the Old Testament, you had prophets and you had kings and you had priests. The apostle, king, priest, but he was a prophet when he walked the earth. So he's all of these things. And, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Let's just, let's move on and then we'll get into it. So Jesus is, this not everything he is, but he is God. He is the word of God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. So he's the word of God. We know he's the son of God, became a son. He's the son of man. That's what he said of himself. He is an apostle. He's a high priest. After the order of Melchizedek, we know that. He is the King of kings, and He is the Lord of lords. These are all things that Jesus is. Now, you're not the King of kings, but you're a king that He's the king of. You're not the high priest, but you're a priest that He is the priest of. So in Revelation, it says this, From Jesus, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Firstborn of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God his Father. So everything that he is, you are. Now you're not an apostle, because that's a specific calling to do something, but you are a king and a priest. What does that mean? That means that you have kingdom kingly authority. Now, we don't know for the, for the ages to come, the unlimited time that is to come, you are ambassadors for God. You are going to be going places and doing things as kings and as heirs, as his sons and his daughters. He's going to send you places to do things. And you're going to go there with kingly authority, but... You're also going to come back, you're also going to come to him with priestly authority. What do the priests do? They come on behalf of somebody else. When I'm praying for someone, I'm coming to God as a priest. If I'm, if I'm speaking to the weather, I'm coming to God, I'm actually operating on earth as a king, but if I'm praying for you, I'm coming to God as a priest. Jesus made us kings and priests unto God. Because he's made me righteous, I have the right to come to him in the fullness of a priest. I mean, having full authority to come on behalf of somebody else and to plead their case. God, I know Randy drives and throws rocks at the cars next to him, but I'm <laughs> pleading on his behalf. No. He doesn't do that. Do you understand what I'm saying? You, you plead on somebody's behalf. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And Revelation 5 says, They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. That's the theme through the whole New Testament. It's the blood of Jesus. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So people, there are people going, ah, oh, just let the Antichrist come so I can get out of here. I want to get out of here. No. You're meant to rule here. The getting out of here is an escape mentality that dest it destroys you from the inside. It's like, I just want to get out of here. That's a destructive thought. But if you recognize you're a king and a priest, you recognize that you have rulership responsibilities, you may not know what they are, but you have them. And so as you walk with God, he's going to start to give you a little bit at a time. He's not going to give you the big thing all at once. He gives you a little bit and says, okay, do this. What if I do it and I fail? Then he'll say, do it again. What if I do it and I fail again? He'll say, do it again until you succeed. Then you'll go to the next thing. It's not about getting the job done as much as it is about you. Now, Melchizedek, we know, well, let's just read it. 
For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Wasn't it after that he met with Melchizedek that it was counted to him for righteousness? He met with him in Genesis 14, and it was counted to him for righteousness in Genesis 15. Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High God, king of righteousness, king of peace. Jesus is not a priest after the order of Levi, which is one of the things that we're going to see. God showing how somebody could be a priest and not be part of the Levitical priesthood. He is a priest not after the order of Levi, but he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the first high priest in the Bible. So there's some people that say, well, well, if you're a priest, you have to be a priest after the order of Levi. No. You don't have to be a priest after the order of Levi because there was a greater priest than Levi. And he was a priest that came before Levi, and he was the priest of righteousness. He was the king of righteousness. He was the king of peace. What is the kingdom? What does the Bible say the kingdom of God is? The kingdom of God is what? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So Melchizedek represents two-thirds of the kingdom. He's a priest of the Most High God. He comes to receive the first tithe given that we have in the Bible recorded from Abraham. So it says that, it said that Levi gave tithe to Melchizedek through his father Abraham. He was still in the loins of Abraham when he gave tithe through Mel- to Melchizedek stating that Melchizedek is a greater priesthood than Levi. And that's important. Remember, the book of Hebrews, he's speaking to the Hebrews. And he's letting them know where this priesthood came from, where Christ's priesthood came from, because they, the only priesthood they knew was the priesthood of Moses, you know, that came from Levi. And in that priesthood, they offered sacrifices all the time. But once a year, the high priest went in and offered the blood sacrifice to what? To, to, not to cleanse, but to cover the sins of the people for a year. So every year, the people's sins were covered. Now, the people still sin, but they were covered because nobody could keep the law. So now, since there hasn't been a high priest that's gone into the temple and used blood to cover the sins of the people... What's happened for the last 2,000 years? Their sins are no longer covered. But they don't have to be covered because now they can be cleansed through a higher blood. It says not through the blood of bulls and goats, but by the bloods of the everlasting covenant, the bloods of the Son of God. (sighs) Thank you, Belinda. The only one that got, everybody else is sitting there like this. I'm kidding. But let's, let's continue on. Because as we go through Hebrews, we've been going through the whole New Testament, and we've hit the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is all about to the Hebrew people. He's explained to the Hebrew people how Christ is their Messiah. He's talking about Moses here, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. As Moses was faithful. This man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses inasmuch as he who has built the house has more honor than the house. Moses was just, he was part of the house. Christ was the one who built the house. Passion translation. For he was faithful to the Father who appointed him in the same way that Moses was a model of faithfulness in what was entrusted to him. But Jesus is worthy to receive a much greater glory than Moses, for the one who builds a house deserves to be honored more than the house he builds. Speaking of Christ. Now, the reason I didn't want to, you know, eventually we're going to get to the seventh chapter of Hebrews, but the reason I wanted to bring up Melchizedek was because you might not understand that, well, why is Christ's priesthood greater than Levi's priesthood? Because Levi was in Abraham when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, who was greater than Abraham. That's well known. Every house is built by some man. But he that built all things is God. And Moses truly was faithful in all his house. There's no, listen, there's no diminishing of who Moses was. 
in this. It's not a diminishing of Moses. He's still this great prophet, but it's an exaltation of Jesus. As a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after, but Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end? Passion translation. I want to just read the one translation because I like to read the old way so people kind of remember it and then read the new way which Jesus spoke in the Aramaic so the Passion Translation was translated from the Aramaic. Every house is built by someone but God is the designer and builder of all things. Indeed, Moses served God faithfully in all he gave him to do. His work prophetically illustrates things that would later be spoken and fulfilled. But Christ is more than a servant. He was faithful as the son in charge of God's house. And now we are part of his house if we continue courageously to hold firmly to our bold confidence and our victorious hope. I think this is as far as I can go tonight. I was going to go a little further, but I think, I think you get the point, don't you? Yeah. So let's stand up. Now, Rodney, would you jump on the piano? And get a mic, Rodney. And can we do, can we do majesty? I just want you to close your eyes for a moment. I want you to see this room filled with angels. They're standing here with you. They're around you. But then I also want you to see yourself as the Bible says that you are a king and a priest seated at the right hand of the Father with Jesus. And I know you can't exactly see the Father's eyes, but if you could see those loving eyes looking at you, telling you that you're more precious than anything, that you're the height of everything he hoped for. And he longs to be with you. Then just lift your hands and let's begin to sing this. Go ahead, Rodney. Majesty. Worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory. Kingdom authority flows from his throne unto his own, who his anthem reigns. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus, magnify. Jesus the King, Jesus the King, Majesty, worship His Majesty, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings, so exalt, lift up on Come glorify Christ Jesus the King, Jesus the King, Majesty. Worship His Majesty, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings, Jesus who died. Rodney's going to play that again, except this time 
You're just going to worship the Lord. You can sing anything you want. You can sing in the Spirit. You can just stand there in His presence and glorify Him. It's just time to come into His presence. Just receive. I want you to receive the love that God has to you. Let Him love you. Put away every thought of condemnation. Put away every thought of how wrong you are and everything you've ever done wrong. Put that away. Let it go. Let Him love you. Let Him genuinely love you. Go ahead, Rodney. Rodney, keep playing, but to those of you who are watching, we're going to sign off. We love you. And I pray that God's grace would be with you this week. His kingdom would be with you. His righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Have an amazing week. We hope to see you here Saturday. God bless you. We love you.